that have been given to me already today. Lord, you know all the needs that are represented in your house. Lord, you know those that are, aren't here because they're not feeling well. Lord, those that are sick, those that are traveling, Lord, those that are out there. Lord, we just pray that you would meet their needs, Lord. Father, we welcome your power and your presence, your spirit into this house today. And when I say this house, I don't mean these four walls. I mean us. Lord, into our house, we welcome you. We welcome you to change, to mold, to shape, to direct who we are, what we do, and how we do it. Lord, we want to be forever changed because of you. We love you, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for loving us. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. signing in their kids. Uh, we have Promise Kids available on our Sunday morning services and our Wednesday night services. Wednesday night starts at 7 p.m. You heard about our sewing circle. If you want to have sewing as your superpower, you can join them at 10 a.m. on Tuesday to 1 p.m. Bring a bag lunch. It's a wonderful time of fellowship. It's a good time to learn how to sew or use your talents to minister to others. Sewing circles open to everybody even your friends who maybe go to another church are welcome to come to 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Or your friends that don't go to church, they're welcome to come too. Yeah. Uh, Monday, uh, the first Monday of every month, we have our ladies meeting at 7 p.m. That is a food and fellowship gathering. The first Saturday of every month, we have men's prayer breakfast. And I guess you know what we do. We have breakfast and we pray, right? There you go. And that is the first Saturday of every month at 7 a.m. The first Sunday of every month from 3 to 5 p.m. Starting this coming up month in April, even though it's Easter, they'll still be meeting our Iron Man, Iron Mongers, Black Smithing small group will be meeting. If you've ever wanted to heat hot and molten metal and beat it into something useful, see Danny Willis and he will help you get started on that. And we have information available to you, available to, for you in the foyer. He says he's got all the tools, you'll just need the proper attire, proper attire. Uh, the third Thursday of every month, Wakala One meet that meets, that is a uh, non-denominational intergalactic fellowship, <laughs> intergalactic fellowship. <laughs> Of all those who believe in Jesus, meeting at 6.30 p.m. for a Bring a Dish Fellowship at the Extension Office, correct? Yes. And then the second Friday of every month here at, at your own very own sanctuary, His Way Youth, grade 6 through 12, 6.30 p.m. Dinner is provided. And we talked about the last Friday of every month. 
We have the uh, family-friendly movie night with popcorn provided. Then we have Man Up, Man Up Bible Study Group meeting every other Monday at 7 p.m. There's contact information in your bulletin there. Whew, lots of stuff going on in our church. Lots and lots of stuff going on. Amen. Fun station event today for the youth. March 29th, River Baptism. We talked about it once already. We'll talk about it again. Followed by a Good Friday prayer service at 7 p.m. We'll get together and we will pray for God to move in a mighty way. And then Easter Day, we're going to, excuse me, Saturday, we're going to have a 11 to 2 Easter egg hunt right here in our sanctuary and in our building. So it's air-conditioned Easter egg hunt. I love that idea, that concept. That is beautiful. Uh, and then we'll have Easter Day. We have communion and dinner on the ground. Bring a dish. We'll be having ham and turkey and all the fixings. We'll have the big tent set up in the back. It'll be a wonderful time to gather together. And then the following Sunday, we have Revival Railroad coming on April 12th. They'll be bringing the word and the music for us. Revival Railroad, April 12th. And then uh, our Church 101, 301, 201, 401 class. I got that all mixed up. May 3rd is the next one for 101 and 201. And then March 29th, right after service for 301 and 401. Wow, we are so very active here. And we want you all to be able to plug in to anything God is directing you to. And with that being said, I'm ready to do some worship. How about you? Father, in the name of Jesus, this is your day. Take over. Take over everything that's said and everything that's done. Take over us. We need you, Jesus. We need you to move in a mighty way. We give you praise for it. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand and worship together.
God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Sing it like you mean it. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Oh, oh, oh. 
Hallelujah. We give you praise, Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. You may be seated just for a moment. We got some more worship to do. But in the meantime, we got something very, 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 very special to take care of. Danielle, you graduate today. The program at Promised Land Ministries. Come on up here, Danielle. We want to hear from you. Now you got to look at the camera. I hold this right here. We'll pose for the camera just for a second. Say cheese. Okay, now we'll pose over here for everybody taking pictures. All right, we got a good thumbs up. Guess what? We want a speech. All right, I just want to start out by giving all the praise and glory to God because without Him, I wouldn't have made it. And uh, when I first got here, I was as broken as you can be. I was at the bottom of the pit of despair. And I was so worried about trying to fix my life myself that I couldn't see the big picture. And I remember the first Sunday I was here, I ran to this altar. I remember it. And I knew in my heart that God was the answer. I just, it took um, some really eye-opening things group <laughs> was one of them, some good stuff, um, and it just helped me to, to see what, what I needed to do, and I don't really know what to say, except God is the key, he, when I had an eye wake, uh, eye wake me experience in group one night, and I went home that night, and boy, let me tell you, I was mad, because they tell you stuff that you don't want to hear about yourself, but it's stuff that you need to hear, and it's stuff you really need to look at the big picture about. And I got it, and I, I really did. I looked, and I dug into my Bible, and I just, I talked to God. And I think that's really when I really did surrender. Amen. And you have to really surrender and just, you've got to give it all. And once you do, when you have that feeling inside, quit worrying about how you can fix your life. Let him do it. And just trust in him. Because he will do it. And I love everybody here. Words can explain how grateful I am for all of y'all. There's been days I didn't know if I was going to make it. And with the support and help of everybody here, I did. And um, Pastor Glenn, you and your family, I love y'all so much. Danny and Stephanie, I don't know if you're here, but I love you. And you told me not you were going to love me until I love myself. And by God, I sure do today. And I thank you for that. And, uh, Mike, you saw me when I first got here. Woo! <laughs> Priorities wasn't right, let me tell you. And there's just something about you. I love you. Chris and Brian, I seen you guys every single day at the thrift store, and there was days I didn't really know if I was going to make it, and Chris, you always told me to go to God. I appreciate it. Brian, I don't know where you are, but I love you too. Where are you? Okay. All right, um, just everybody that's helped me through this, all the teachers that have came and taught class, my girls. <laughs> it's been a long journey, and I love all y'all, and I'll be seeing you guys, so it's not goodbye. Um, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank you for sticking by me. At the beginning, I didn't know what was going to happen with us, and I didn't want to raise my son in a broken home, and uh, God knows your heart, and I talked to him for a long time about it, and he knows your heart, and he knows what's right, and he brought you around, and I know that we're going to be fine, and my little man's not here, but I'll see him soon as I get home, and um, I just love all y'all, and thank you all for being supportive. Amen, amen. Y'all give Danielle a hand. Listen, uh, I think Charlie deserves a hand, too, for sticking by her the whole time. I got one other thing to do before we go back into praise and worship. We have a graduate of our program here, a couple of them here today, that wants to give a praise report. And I'm not going to tell him he can't. He got here a little late. 
coming all the way from Tallahassee, but he's here and he wants to give a praise report. Yeah, I apologize I'm late. My wife wanted to be here, but she got dressed and wasn't feeling good, so I, I came by myself um, uh, probably about two months ago, and I want you to keep your judgment to yourself until you hear the whole story. Uh, about two months ago, um, you know, she wasn't feeling good and went and got a pregnancy test, and there it was. Uh, she was it was positive. So, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't very happy about it. I'm not gonna lie to you. I was, I was not excited. I, I wasn't happy. I, I didn't, I didn't want another child. You know, I, you know, just a, a, a year ago yesterday, I graduated from Promised Land. Amen. So I'm still trying to, you know, still getting on my feet. You know, I'm, you know, I'm working. She's working, and you know, I'm just thinking about money and, you know, how we're gonna do this type of thing. And I wasn't thinking about you know, what God wanted. He's, he created it, but I didn't, I didn't want it. And uh, so you know, I talked talk to Dan a few times, uh, you know, telling me it's a blessing and um, I didn't want to hear it. So uh, she wanted to have it, I didn't. So I finally talked her into, you know, you know going to get a procedure done, an abortion. Uh, so we set it up, I had, went to Jacksonville and we, right when we got into Jacksonville, they, uh, they, I called them, say, hey, we're you know we're right around the corner, and they're like, oh, we can't see any patients today. Uh, they're, they're, our system's down, the ultrasound's down. We can't see anybody. I'm like, yeah, you wait till I get all the way here, and now we got to turn it all the way back around. So I turned around, went back Thank to Tallahassee, Jesus. and you know, Nikki's telling me, you know, it's a you know, it's a, a sign from God. I'm telling you, Eddie, it's a sign from God. But I still don't want to hear it. You know, set it up for two weeks later. We go back two weeks later. You know, she's back there and I'm waiting about 45 minutes later, she comes out and she's like, Eddie, I need you to see this. She goes, you know, I'm 16 weeks pregnant. And she shows me the ultrasound and, you know, it's a baby, it's not a dot, it's not a peanut, you know, it's a baby, it's a head, the arms, the whole nine yards. And, and it just, you know, came, you know, I said, all right, well, let's, you know, she's like, they can still do it, but it's gonna take like five hours to do and, you know, and it's gonna be on Monday. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, five hours to do something like this? You know, that's, that's murder, you know, straight up. So we went to breakfast and we talked about it and, you know, I just, something just came over me and I just, I just became like immediately excited about having this child. Like, you know, Amen. Like, thank telling you, like, Jesus. 30 minutes. <laughs> Thirty minutes before that, I was so dead set to having this done, and you know, not excited about it at all. And it's just so miraculous how you know how God can just overcome you and just make you feel at peace about something, you know. And you know, it's and it's true. It was, it's a sign from Him. He, you know, He want He has a plan for me. He has a plan for me and my wife. And you know, I'm excited to see what what it is, and I'm. I'm all I'm all for it. I'm I'm really excited. So that's my announcement. Like you know, we're having a kid. And <laughs> and it's not like you know, oh, well we're having a baby. We're having a baby in nine months. It's now it's like yeah, we're having a baby any minute. So it's you know right around the corner. I think she's about five months now. So we have like four months to go. So I thank God for His plan. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. God has a way of intervening and making his will known to his people, even when we can be obstinate and stubborn and want our way over his way. And I thank God that he's able to do that. Amen. I praise Jesus that he's able to reach down, change our hearts and change our minds and reach down to the very pit of who we are and change the very makeup of who we are that we could be what he's created us to be. Give God some glory in this house. Amen. And let's worship. Let's stand and worship together. Thank you, Jesus.
because Lord, you know.
seated. We're doing a series leading up to Easter called Shadows. Shadows. Last week we talked about being in the shadows of the garden. And that in the shadows of the garden we were facing Jesus' face and we faced broken promises, broken religion, and a broken heart. That was a good sermon. It had three parts to it. Y'all know we like three-part sermons. Today, I'm going to blow your mind. I've only got two parts. So I don't know how to close without that third part, but it'll be two points that we'll be going over today. And the title of this message is In the Shadows of Golgotha, uh, Golgotha, uh, the place of the skull. In the opening passage, as we move into the scripture, it's going to take us to the hill of Jerusalem called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Understand now, this is a place of brutality. It's a place of pain. It's a place of sorrow. It's a place of torture. And it's a place of death. Shane, if you could turn those dimmers up just a little bit, we won't be able to, everybody will be able to read along. There you go. Thank you. Appreciate it. If you have your Bibles ready, we're going to uh, turn to Luke chapter 23. And we're going to start in verse 33. But I, I want to tell you that as I read over this passage of Scripture, this particular passage of Scripture is probably one of the most uncomfortable passages that you can read. In fact, they're pretty much my least favorite passages of Scripture and also my most loved passages of Scripture. Because... When I read these, I'm faced with what my disobedience, what my sin, what my life against God and his word cost my Savior. And we'll start in verse 33. It says, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. 
Don, if you could just turn me down just a smidge, I'd appreciate it. The place of the skull, the cross, Golgotha, the place of brutality, the place of torture, the place where Jesus laid down his life for us. A horrifying place. The songwriter put it this way. He said, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Golgotha is a place which our lives should break and crumble and where Christ should become all and in all. Think of this. Son of God. God incarnate in flesh. On a cross. Not pretty like this. Not sterile and shellacked and shiny and hanging so prominently in our sanctuary clean. Not like the cross that you wear around your neck that symbolizes the freedom and the sacrifice that, 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 that Christ made for us. But this, if you could imagine just for a moment, if you could transport you to that day and age, to that time where Jesus was, when he was carrying that cross upon his back, that, that, that hard, rough lumber, splintered upon his torn flesh. Think about this. We, we've all seen the passion of Christ. And we've all seen how they beat him on that post. And, and how they took that, that cat of nine tails, uh, uh, an item similar to, to this, that, that had shards of bone and metal and, and hooks. And, and, and what is this, Danny? Swirly thing that you made here? Swirly thing. All, all, the, all these different things that, that were on the end of this thing. And they'd take this thing and they'd whip him. They'd whip him so hard against the back, it would rip his flesh when they pulled it off. This is what the Son of God did for you and I. He could have stopped it at any given time. At any given time, he could have said enough. But he chose to go through all of it for you and I. In fact, the Greek reads, if we go back just a moment, the Greek reads, when it says, Father, verse 34, it says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The Greek reads, after all this, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what. Think of this. After all what? After having his flesh ripped apart? After having his beard ripped out, after being mocked and spit on, after having a crown of thorns placed upon his head, shoved down and being mocked, the blood running down his face. Scripture tells us he wasn't even recognizable as a man. That's what Jesus did for us. It wasn't a sterile picture. It wasn't a pretty thing. It was not pretty at all. It was ugly. It was painful. It was brutal. And after all this, after all this, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know what, not what they do. That's the first point of our sermon today. The power of forgiveness. The power of forgiveness. The cross was a device of unimaginable Brutality. Picture Jesus there, nailed to that cross. Friends, we've got it so easy. We've got it so easy. There are countries right now. In today's society, they cannot gather and worship Jesus freely. We've got it so easy in this country. 
We've got it so easy that we can gather together on Sunday mornings, Wednesday night, Monday nights, Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, Friday nights, Saturday, any night of the week we want to, any day of the week we want to, and gather and worship and pray and seek our Savior. We've got it easy. And even though we have it so easy, somehow, some way, the enemy finds a way to occupy our time. So we don't have enough time for him. Even though we have it so easy, somehow, some way, we just can't seem to muster up the strength to live how we know that we ought to live. We can't make the decisions that would bring God glory in our lives. We can't make the choices that would, that would exemplify Christ-like behavior. I watched a uh, video on YouTube the other day that my wife showed me about this village in Ethiopia. These two little kids just so malnourished Hungry. Body was eating it itself. Their parents had died and nobody was there to take care of them. But their little sister who was nine years old, who was lugging off mile after mile after mile to go get water. The, the video says that she couldn't give them no food because there was no food. The only thing that she could do was go walk mile after mile after mile. A little girl this tall carrying water jugs bigger than her back to bathe these two little kids. Even though she couldn't feed them, she could bathe them. And it struck me that here in our society, as we look upon the shadows of the cross and we look at the shadows of Golgotha and what Christ did for us, yet we don't even want to give of ourselves to him. Friends, I want to share something with you, and I don't want to break your heart, and I don't want to offend you, and I certainly don't want to make you not come back to church because we love having you here. But the reality is this. All the things that you're working so hard for aren't going to go nowhere with you. All the houses, all the cars, all the money, all the things that you're out there striving to go after amount to nothing. Friends, I want to tell you something. The only thing that we can do that will stand the test of time are the things that we do for Jesus. Now, God may have blessed you with a good job. Praise the Lord. Maybe he's got an opportunity for you to sow into ministries and missions and outreach projects. There's nothing wrong with money. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil, not money itself. A lot of people get that confused. Friends, only the things that we do for the glory of God will stand the test of time. Jesus on the cross, the crown of thorns down upon his head, the, the blood dried upon him. He's there. He's giving of himself. And even after all of this, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is the power of forgiveness, my friends. That is the power of forgiveness. Do you know as he was there upon the cross, when he cried out, he said, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? When he cried that out upon the cross, all of our sins, my sin, your sin, the sin of all mankind had come upon him. And he was at once separated from God because of sin. The power of forgiveness is this, that everything I've ever done, everything I've ever thought about doing, everything that I don't know that I'm going to do, but I will do anyways, that is sin, God has forgiven. That is a powerful statement. It's a real statement of God's love. Now, friends, I want to tell you something. This is a dangerous message. Some will leave here and go, oh, so I can do what I want to do since God's forgiven me. I can live how I want to live. 
I can go get drunk. I can go get high. I can cheat whoever I want to. If you can do that, you don't know my Savior. Because I want to tell you something. When I do something wrong, the Holy Spirit convicts me. In such a way that it makes me really, really sorry that I did it. So sorry I don't ever want to feel that way again. Amen? Amen. And then that comes repentance. Repentance means to do an about face. Some people think repentance is to come to the altar and say, I'm sorry, and go right back out there and do it all over again. That ain't repentance. Repentance is when you say, I'm sorry, you come in agreement with God that what you've done is wrong, and you go back the other direction and don't do it no more. Amen? You know, Jesus died on the cross for every last piece of gossip. I picked gossip to talk about. Because this is church. Anybody ever been part of a church before? You ever notice that there's gossip around? <sighs> if y'all join this church, you got to sign a member covenant that says you ain't going to gossip. <laughs> okay? Because it don't go nowhere. It don't do nothing. All it does is tear apart the body of Christ. Look, if you was perfect, you would be Jesus. And until you're Jesus, you ain't got no right to judge nobody else. Amen? Now, you do have a right to go to them in prayer and say, hey, can I help you? Do you need some help? I love it when people, I find out people are talking about me. I love that. You hear all kinds of crazy stories that they tell you, they say about you. Really crazy stories. And you're like, if they cared so much to tell everybody in the county, why didn't they care enough to come ask me and I could have told them the truth instead of what they thought they saw? You know, I mean, it's crazy. Gossip. Jesus died for every bit of gossip, for every bit of anger. Anybody ever had an anger problem here? Okay, I know who not to hang out with now. Okay, thank you. I hope somebody writes all those names down. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Look, Jesus died for our anger problems. He died for our sins. He died for everything. And there on that cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Do you realize that that passage of Scripture makes Isaiah 55 and 4 all the more clear? Let's read these passages from Isaiah real quick. It says, go ahead and pull it up for me there, Shane. You don't have it? Isaiah 55, 4. 53-4. It's supposed to be 55-4. No, 53-4. Who's right, me or you? It looks like you're right. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we are considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Let's go on to the next verse, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that bought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. One more verse, right? Verse 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you realize that the iniquity of all of us was laid on him? It was foretold by the prophet Isaiah, and it came to pass at the crucifixion that your sin, my sin, the sins of the entire world would be laid upon him, and that he would deliver us and set us free. See, we don't have to go sacrifice a sheep no more. Praise God, because I don't even know nobody who grows any sheep, raises any sheep. Amen. You do? Well, I don't need one, because Jesus took care of it for me. Amen. Okay. You know, that is the power of forgiveness. The words that say, God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, that whosoever... Notice that whosoever. What does that mean? Anybody. Black, white, yellow, purple. Usually if they're purple, it's a little too late. But uh, it don't matter the color. Anybody, whosoever, would believe on him should not perish, but will have 
everlasting life. Friends, I, I've got a God that loves me. I've got a God that cares about me. And he cares about you. He loves you. And he knew every last stinking mistake you'd make. And he paid the penalty for it. That's freedom. That's the power of forgiveness. The second point for those who are taking notes today and want to write down the points. The second point of today's sermon is the reality of forgiveness. We've talked about the power of forgiveness. Now we want to talk about the reality of forgiveness. We can find that very simply in verse 43 of the same passage we were on before in Luke. Luke 23, 43. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, I guarantee you, there have probably never been any sweeter words spoken in the entire history of all mankind than today you will be with me in paradise. Can I share something with you about this thief on the cross just momentarily? Just in a split second, he went from going to hell to go into heaven. Think about this. He didn't have to understand theology. He didn't have to understand doctrine. He didn't have to go to seminary school. He didn't even have to be able to quote John 3.16 because it wasn't even written yet at that point in time. He didn't even have to be able to do that. He was there on the cross paying the price, the consequence of his sin on a death sentence about the croak when Jesus said, because you've recognized me, who I am, today you will be with me in paradise. Yeah. Friends, the reality of forgiveness is this. No matter where you've been, what you've done, how you've lived, today you can be with him in paradise. No, I ain't talking about giving y'all no Kool-Aid, okay? Don't worry, okay? Some of you think, I don't know if I want to go to paradise yet. Kind of enjoying in this non-paradise here in Wakulla County, right? <laughs> I want you to think about this now. Just, just, just stay with me just for a moment. These two criminals evidently had to walk up the same hill that Jesus walked up. They had to carry the same crosses that Jesus had to carry. And, and, and we don't know, but they probably were both at that moment, since they didn't even recognize him or didn't know who he was or for whatever reason, probably both at that moment as they're going up that hill, probably both of them were thinking, you know, here's this idiot right here. Thinks he's something special. Look, he's about to suffer the same thing we are. They probably both had these thoughts going on. And maybe they were even both vocal about it. But somehow, some way, maybe it was in the compassion that Jesus showed that after all this, Jesus would say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Somehow, some way, one of them was able to recognize Jesus as the Son of God and make a commitment to be with him. It says here, I don't, I don't think I have it plugged up there for you, but I'll read it to you anyways. It says, verse 40, says, But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since we, you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Friends, the reality of forgiveness is this. Today, if you'll recognize Jesus as the Messiah, today, if you'll recognize Jesus as your Savior, today, you can be with him in paradise. Can I share something with you just momentarily before we get this thing ready to close out for you today? I want to talk about paradise for a minute. 
I used to think that salvation and paradise and that victorious life and all that kind of stuff was, you know, something you got when you died. I don't know if anybody else ever felt that way, you know. I remember as a young child going to the altar and, and, and wanting to get saved. I was raised in Southern Baptist Church. Both my grandfathers were Southern Baptist ministers, and, and they were pretty good at preaching some hellfire brimstone messages, if you know what I mean. Maybe some of y'all been in there and go, you're going to hell, like those type things. <laughs> Scared me to death. I'd run to the altar almost every time, and and, and, and I would say that sinner's prayer, and, I, and I'd try to get me a fire insurance policy. I could stick in my back pocket, you know, one of those get-out-of-hell-free cards, you know. Uh, but I really didn't have any change in my life. I was still doing things my way. And, and I thought that, you know, that, that, that it must be that when you die, then you go to paradise. When you die, then you enter heaven. When you die, then you find out what an abundant life is. And I want to tell you something. There was many years ago, I can't tell you how many years ago it was, I had taken a Sunday off of work to go down to a river baptism to see a family member get baptized at the Sop Choppy River. Sure did. And they didn't show because they hadn't changed their life. But there I was at the church service. And, and a, as they were there at the river baptism, the pastor says, there's anybody else here that needs to get their baptism in order. I want to invite you to come. And I found myself taking my wallet out of my back pocket and throwing it on the ground and my cell phone out and throwing it on the ground, kicking my shoes off and walking into the water. Because I knew I had to get things straight. See, I had recommitted my life to the Lord and I had done it privately. And I had recommitted my life to the Lord and I had done it semi-publicly. But I had not got my baptism in order. And I want to tell you something. From that moment forth, I have never looked back. And then from that moment forth, I realized that the abundant life is for here and now. And that paradise is for here and now. And the everlasting life is for here and now. See, I ain't going to die. It ain't something I'm going to get when I die. I'm just going to change addresses. Amen. And that's the reality of forgiveness. If I get the praise team on up here, I'm fixing to bring this thing to a close for you. See, the power of forgiveness is that your sins, no matter how significant they are, no matter how minor they are, your sins are forgiven. And the reality of forgiveness is is this, today, today you can be in paradise. Today you can know what it is to have peace. Today you can know what it is to know love. Today you can know what it is to have joy, even in the midst of people talking about you, even in the midst of people coming against you, even in the midst of picking up the pieces of a broken life. Today, you can know what it is to be in paradise. That is the reality of forgiveness. Jesus loves you. God knew every last mistake that every one of us would make. And because he knew, he made provision. And friends, I want to tell you something. If you think you're looking at a perfect man who gets it all right all the time, you are dead wrong. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you. Amen. And the greatest thing that I want to share with you is this. You don't have to be perfect. All you have to do is love Him and be obedient and be able when you get it wrong to say, I'm sorry, and try again. Amen. I'm going to close this thing a little bit different today. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to give you a chance to come to the altar in just a minute. But, but while every head's bowed and every eye's closed, nobody looking around now. If you've never 
publicly accepted Christ as your Savior. I just want you to slip your hand up real quick. One, two, I got two, three, four. Come on, slip your hand up real quick. Put it back down. That's four people. They say they never publicly accepted Christ as their Savior. Friends, if, if, if you haven't got your baptism in order, maybe you've accepted Christ as your Savior, but you haven't got your baptism in order, just want you to raise your hand up real quick and put it back down. Hands are going up all over the place. Okay, put them back down. If you're today, you're ready to know the power of forgiveness and the reality of forgiveness. just want you to slip your hands up in the air. Very good, very good. That's good, that's good, that's good. Put them back down. Let's stand. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for all these that raised their hands. Lord, I thank you for those that are, that, that are saying they're ready to accept the power of forgiveness. Lord, they're ready to accept what you've done for them. Lord, I thank you for those that are ready to receive the reality of forgiveness. Lord, they're ready to be your children. They're ready to move forward in the relationship. They're ready to publicly say, I'm yours, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, just minister your grace right now. Just pour out your power here today, Lord God. And the shadows of the cross, the shadows of Golgotha, that place of brutality. We receive your love, Lord. We thank you for what you've done. Give you praise for it. I'm going to get my altar team down here real quick. And, and listen, if you raise your hand, I just want you to find me or find an altar.